In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I will give my reaction for last night's lottery. I am here live in Chicago. If you hear music and basketball is bouncing in the background, it's because I am at the Wind Trust Arena where the scrimmages will take place in just a few hours. So stay tuned and get my reaction of last night's lottery. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, and I am solo dolo right now because I recorded two episodes yesterday with Leaf Tulin and Richard Stamen, and my memory card, I can't find it. Someone picked up my memory card. I am waiting to figure out where it went. I don't know why I set it out and I left it on the table. And it's gone. I've checked my bag. It's just a long mess. I've been up for hours and hours and hours. I get back to the arena this morning and they tell me someone saw it and picked it up. So we're trying to track it. So the episodes that I did last night, I had an interview with a player. Hopefully I did not lose them. But anyway, so I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director scouter for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. Last night was a a crazy night. I had a lot of work to do. I had multiple appearances on radios and I did a live stream on the Bleach Report app. And the San Antonio Spurs, who I predicted would get the number one pick, got the number one pick. Yesterday was a very interesting day around here in Chicago. I spoke to multiple team executives just because in Chicago everybody's in the lobby and they're, they're passing by. There was one member of the San Antonio Spurs front office who I saw the night before who told me that he had been listening to French rap music all day. I thought he was joking until he named the rapper. So he had been listening to French rap music all day and I sent him a congratulations text this morning because maybe that is what got San Antonio the number one pick, Victor Wimbayama. I think it is the, the best situation even though I think that no matter where Vic would have went, they would have figured out a way to make it work. But in San Antonio, he immediately becomes the face of a franchise that has a track record of churning out Hall of Fame centers from David Robinson. I think David Robinson was in 87 draft. Tim Duncan was in a 97 draft. And then now you have Victor Wimbayama, who is now, well, it hasn't happened yet, but you can pretty much assume that San Antonio Spurs are going to take Wimbayama number one. I mean, at this point, they should start printing out Victor Wimbayama jerseys in San Antonio on the draft day. They don't really need to go through all the, the pre-draft suspense. Just have Victor come on stage, give him the jersey. Because more than likely, if, Fran, if, if his team in France makes it to the finals, he's going to have to get out of there and take a jet back to, to Paris and, and play in the French finals. But with San Antonio winning number one, they had the, I think they had a tie for, for the best odds. But on the flip side of that, you have the Houston Rockets and the Detroit Pistons. They had the same odds, and Detroit had the worst case scenario, picking fifth. Houston picks fourth. Their worst case scenario was sixth, but you kind of have to feel sorry for those fan bases because they entered the day with so much hype about the possibility of landing Victor Wimbayama, who many people are saying is the best prospect since LeBron James. Some are saying the best prospect ever. It's still a little early to say that. I think now this media hype has put a tremendous amount of additional pressure on, on Wimbayama. But if you're the Houston Rockets, at number four, you, you still have an opportunity to get one of the best players. And if you're Detroit at number five, the absolute worst case scenario, you have some options there. But let's get into number two, where I believe the draft is really going to start because the Charlotte Hornets have the second pick. And I think the Charlotte Hornets are going to select Brandon Miller. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm going to look into the camera here. If you're listening on a podcast, you, you, you can't see me on camera. Back in January, I had mentioned that I thought Brandon Miller had a chance to be the second pick in the draft. And I absolutely got crucified for it. Now it looks like Brandon Miller 
will be the number two pick in the draft. And if you're Scoot Henderson, you have to you have to be a little disappointed in the outcome, in my opinion, because Charlotte has their point guard and, and LaMelo Ball. Portland, who picks third, has Damian Lillard. So you're not going to an ideal situation where they're giving you the keys to the franchise and making you their quarterback right away. The best situation for Scoot Henderson, in my opinion, would have been San Antonio, possibly Houston. I thought Detroit was a, a bad fit. But now he's in a situation where he could possibly fall to not only number three, but he could end up being drafted by a team like Portland that decides to trade the pick. So it was probably a very, very disappointing outcome for, for Scoot Henderson. And this is a guy that believes, which he rightfully so, believes that he should be the number one pick. So we're in this situation where back in October, after the first game of the Scoot versus Wimbayama sweepstakes, or I'm sorry, showcase, there were some people that thought Vic was one, Scoot 1A. Then we heard all the talk about, oh, Scoot would be the number one pick in any other draft. If it wasn't for Victor Wimbayama, Scoot would be the number one pick. Now we're looking at a situation where he could end up being the third pick behind Brandon Miller, who people, well, I've, I've been a big fan of Brandon Miller all season. Not that I'm not a fan of Scoot, but Brandon Miller had a historically bad NCAA tournament. Historically bad NCAA tournament. And on top of just the, you know, the situation that happened off the court, Brandon Miller could end up being selected over Scoot Henderson. And I think for Charlotte, it is the, the best fit. I think with LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller, if, if P.J. Washington is back, Mark Williams had a strong finish to a senior year. I think Charlotte has to be pleased with the outcome. Again, if you're Scoot Henderson, you probably don't want to go into a situation in Charlotte where you're splitting ball handling duties and the concern about Scoot's outside shooting, at least as of right now in the short term, makes it hard to, to assume that it's a good fit for him to spend time off the ball. Now there are a lot of people that believe you take the best player available no matter who you have on your roster. And they think Scoot is the best player available, so they think Charlotte should just figure out how to make it work. Then, you know, you hear the talk about, oh, it's a positionless NBA with LaMelo size. He can play and, and defend multiple positions. I, I get all that, but I just don't think it is the best fit. And I don't think Portland is the best fit either. Unless Portland is open to entertaining, trading Damian Lillard, which don't know if it's going to happen or Portland could decide that all right we have the number three pick we have Scoot Henderson we know there are teams that really like him we can trade the number three pick and we can bring in another big name star to play alongside Damian Lillard I'm just throwing it out there if you're Philadelphia and eh, I don't know about the money how, how the money would match but if you're Philadelphia and if James Harden leaves in free agency and Joel Embiid is not pleased with with the roster that he has and you decide that maybe we want to start from scratch do you say no to the number three pick and some some future picks and maybe another young player from Portland and just kind of start the process 2.0 I don't know it's going to be very interesting at, at number four is the Houston Rockets and I think the Houston Rockets even though they didn't get the outcome that they expected, I think they're in a really good situation. They can address a need for point guard and Amon Thompson. And now you have to ask yourself, would Amon Thompson and Jalen Green, would that be like the most athletic backcourt in NBA history? You have two freakishly amazing top-tier athletes in the backcourt. But you have to also have to wonder about, about the fit. Thompson does have some struggles shooting the ball. Shot about 30% from three. Not a great free throw shooter. I think he's at his best when he has the ball in his hands. And so is Jalen Green. So that fit could be interesting there. But I think Houston has probably one of the easiest choices with the fourth pick in Amon Thompson. Now at number five, the Detroit Pistons, who, again, had the worst case scenario if you're Detroit. 
I think you go with Cam Whitmore. I, I think Cam Whitmore would be the fit there. Troy Weaver, the, the Pistons GM, has a track record of valuing athleticism. And with Whitmore, you get an athletic combo forward that can shoot, create his own shot. I know there are some concerns about, oh, the, the passing and the decision-making, but I don't think he is going to be in the position where he's going to have to make a lot of decisions and be an additional ball handler and creator, especially in Detroit. You have Jaden Ivey, you have Kate Cunningham. With Cam Whitmore, in my opinion, all he has to do is run the floor, score, and transition, knock down open shots, and you know, create his own shot from time to time. He's not going to be the franchise guy that is going to have to make a lot of decisions with the ball. So over time, I think he can develop that. But right away, he is a, a piece to the Pistons rebuilding puzzle and doesn't have to come in and be somewhat of a, a franchise guy, which overall I feel like in this class, even the worst teams from Maybe San Antonio doesn't have him, but from Detroit to Houston to Charlotte, those teams already have their dude. They have their guy. So even with a high draft pick, you're not necessarily looking for your franchise guy. You're looking for a player that can complement your franchise guy that you already have in place. And Cam Whitmore in Detroit, I think, would be a good complementary piece to what they already have. Okay. Now, if you're looking for some comfortable pants to wear that fit – and they provide versatility, then you have to check out bird dogs. You look and you feel great wearing bird dogs. Their stretchy fabric makes your legs look great, and they are comfier than wearing shorts and pants. They give you the freedom to wear one of a pair of shorts or pants on the golf course to a meeting, a date, or hanging out with friends. That is bird dogs. So if you're looking to have some pants that you can wear and they're comfortable and you can wear them with Anywhere you want to go, like I said, from the golf course to a meeting to a date, church, your son's school play, whatever, go to birddogs.com, Locked on NBA. And when you enter the promo code Locked on NBA, they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. I've even heard some people say that the Bird Dogs are great for the dad bods out there that have a little bit of gut because it still makes them feel comfortable and look great even though they got a little gut there. So check it out, birddogs.com. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And in tomorrow's episode, it will be me, Richard Stamen, and Leaf Tuline. We are here in Chicago. I will give them an opportunity to share their reactions to the NBA Combine and also some of the scrimmages that are going on. Again, I apologize to Richard and Leaf because I don't know where my memory card is and watch it end up popping up after I record this episode. All right, let's get back to yesterday's lottery. And with the sixth pick, it is the Orlando Magic. And I think Orlando could select someone that wasn't too far from their facility. Taylor Hendricks. I think Taylor Hendricks is one of the biggest winners on draft night. He went from being somewhat of a mid-first round pick to you started seeing him as a potential late lottery pick. And now I think with the way things turned out, he could end up in Orlando at, at number six. Orlando could also look at Jairus Walker. I, th I think six may be a little bit high for Grady Dick, even though he addresses a major, 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 major need for Orlando. Orlando struggled with shooting. But I think you can get shooting with Taylor Hendricks. He shot 39% from three. He's athletic. May not be the best fit for immediate like playing time as a starter because they have Paolo Bencaro and Franz Wagner. But those are two of the most versatile forwards in the NBA you can get creative with some lineups and have one of them serve as the primary ball handler and, and and just run some creative lineups but Orlando needs outside shooting and let me let me give you these stats Orlando finished 24th in the league in three-point field goal percentage at 34 percent they were 27th in attempts at 31 and they were 25th in three-pointers made at 10.8 per game. What's crazy is 10.8 three-pointers made per game a few years back was, was a lot. So Orlando needs shooting, and Taylor Hendricks could provide some additional front-court shooting. So I think that would be my option there. Now, at number seven, it is the Indiana Pacers. 
And if I'm the Pacers and if Taylor, Taylor Hendricks is off the board, then I'm going with Jairus Walker. Walker provides toughness, defense, rebounding. He is a much better playmaker than he was able to show at Houston. And a Walker, Halliburton, pick and roll, I, I think could really work because Walker is such a good playmaker that he's a guy that you can give the ball to in the middle of the floor and he can make plays. So if a team decides to trap Halliburton and he puts the ball in Walker's hands in the middle, now you have a, a an advantage because you have two defenders already out of the play and now with, with your advantage, Walker has that nice little touch floater and then he has the court vision to make reads, whether it's hitting the lob threat or, or finding a man in the corner. So I really like the fit for Indiana if Jairus Walker is available at number seven that would be my choice. Now, number eight is the Washington Wizards. Washington, I think, really needs help at, at point guard, and they have they have some options here at number eight. They can go with Casey Wallace. They can go with Anthony Black. They can go with Asor Thompson, who we haven't mentioned. They can even go with Nick Smith. And the reason I say Nick Smith is despite the fact that he did not have a great season, he was in and out of the lineup due to a, a right knee issue, was never able to find his rhythm, but he does have a relationship with Bradley Bill, the team star, Bradley Bill, who's making a gazillion dollars. Bradley Bill coached Nick Smith on his Bradley Bill elite AAU team, so they have a relationship there. So if, or if Washington is looking to address the need at point guard, Bill... Uh, I'm sorry, Nick Smith could be an option. Kaysen Wallace is someone that I think they should strongly consider. Probably the most polished of, of the guards available at, at this rate, at this stage in the draft. Anthony Black, tested well, 39-inch vert, has the size and the passing. There are some concerns about his outside shooting. And Asor Thompson, who is a phenomenal athlete, who I think is going to be... A point guard. The reason I think he is best as a point guard is because he really struggles off the ball. And I think if you put him in a situation where he's playing off the ball, you basically are putting him out there as a, a non-factor, in my opinion, in the half court. So teams are going to double off of him. But then again, I don't know if the Washington Wizards are going to be in the playoffs next year. So I don't know how much it really, really matters because you see non-shooters becoming really ineffective in playoff series. So I, depending on if they feel like they can fix the shooting and if they feel like he is a real point guard, then Washington can go to Sor Thompson and then go to Anthony Black. I think I would go with I think I would go with Casey Wallace here. Casey Wallace is the best defender out of the group and then with his defense he can play on and off the ball. And I, I've said it all season long. I think he has more game than he was able to show at Kentucky this season. And Kentucky guards have a tendency to outplay their draft position. At number nine is the Utah Jazz, and if the Wizards select Casey Wallace, if I'm Utah, I'm going with Anthony Black. I think Anthony Black would be perfect in Utah. Again, the size, the playmaking, the high IQ, there's so many different things he brings to the table, and if Utah believes that they can fix his shooting, then they end up with a their point guard for the future, and I think Anthony Black could be very good. At, at number 10 it is the Dallas Mavericks. Now, if it shakes out the way I think it shakes out, or the way I'm predicting, Dallas is in a situation where you missed out on Taylor Hendricks, you missed out on Jairus Walker, and now you aren't able to address your, your need for front court help. Now, Dallas could gamble on Derek Lively, and the reason I say I would really, really strongly consider Derek Lively is because he is someone that I think could have a really good year in, in Dallas. He has the size, athleticism, and mobility to impact games. He is an excellent rim protector, the best rim protector in this class outside of Victor Wimbayama. And I think playing in Dallas, he gives them size, he gives them rebounding, and he has a simplified role. And I think that he could have a similar, have similar success like Walker Kessler. Walker Kessler was someone that I overthought about last year. I thought, oh, he can't defend his space, he can't do this. And I didn't really factor in what he did extremely well, which was protect the rim and rebound. 
And I think Lively could be that guy in Dallas. Now, whether or not they take him at 10, you can say, oh, why would you take him at 10 when you can make a trade and pick up an asset and, 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 and draft him later on in the second round or later on in the first round. But if Lively, let's say he ends up being like Walker Kessler, in a redraft, that's a top 10 pick. So if you think he can do what Walker Kessler did, was protect the rim, rebound, finish lobs and dunks, and he has a similar success, then that's top 10 productions. I would strongly consider Derek Lively at Dallas, for Dallas at number 10, even though he only averaged like three points per game. And I know someone mentioned to me, well, when have you seen a guy that put up those poor numbers ever be productive as a first round pick? I mean, this is a different era. This is a different era. I think the fit is more important there. But Dallas could also consider Kobe Bufkin, who's a big riser on my board. I think he can complement Luka. He can play on and off the ball. He's an excellent finisher. Shot 71% at the rim in college basketball. College basketball, especially in the Big Ten where there's not a lot of spacing, 71% is crazy impressive. So imagine what he could do with NBA spacing. He is a, a good defender, and I think he can play alongside Luka Doncic. I really do. And I think that if Buff can were a freshman. He's the same age as a lot of freshmen. He's actually younger than his teammate Jed Howard. If Bufkin was a freshman, or were a freshman, and he had the production that he had, I think he'd be talked about a lot more. But he only averaged like three points a game as a freshman, had a much stronger sophomore year, which put him in this position to be a potential lottery pick. And he, he's starting to get the buzz, but I think if he came in with the same fanfare and buzz as some of the other prospects in this class, it wouldn't seem outlandish to see him at number 10. Number 11, it is the Orlando Magic back on the clock. And I wonder what Orlando does here. Is it a situation where they look to consolidate and trade two of their picks and add some veterans? I don't know. But if they stay pat, and I talked about earlier, Grady Dick is the answer. He fills a major need for shooting. Like I said, Orlando finished 24th in the league in three-point field goal percentage. Grady Dick is a 40% shooter from deep. He has gravity. He is the ideal complementary piece for Paolo Bencaro and the Orlando Magic. So to me, that's a no-brainer. Now at number 12, if I'm the Oklahoma City Thunder and Sam Presti has a tremendous amount of job security, he is not afraid to go against the grain and he selected a Frenchman last year around this range. I would go with Bilal Koulibaly, or Koulibaly. He is, to me, the biggest riser in this draft. And it's a crazy situation. I talked to Mike Schmidt yesterday. And we were at a game in Paris in January 2022. And Bilal was unknown. We didn't even know his name. We had to look on, the, on, on Eurobasket and, and try to find out his name. And here it is. About 18 months later, he is a potential lottery pick. We saw the potential. We thought he was raw, thought he had a ways to go, but his trajectory over the last, I mean, you can start the last 18 months, you can go back to a year, but even the last few weeks, his strong play on a team that is competing for a French League title, I think it has put him in position to be a lottery pick. And the Thunder have the luxury of being able to develop him and wait. I mean, they waited on Chet Holmgren, who I think could have played this year. They have the luxury of waiting on him and waiting until he develops. He is long. He's athletic. He's, he's, he's bouncy, but he's really smooth with it. And he is someone that, <laughs> if he ends up being a lottery pick, that is, that is going to be one of the better storylines in this class. So if I'm Oklahoma City Thunder, that's where I'm going. Now, number 13, the Toronto Raptors have some options. If Anthony Black is available, then I would look at Anthony Black. He gives them size and, and versatility. Blau seems like a Toronto Raptors type pick. But I would go with Nick Smith. I think with Nick Smith, if you put into context why he struggled this season, coming in and out of the lineup, and you see that he shot the ball well off the catch, and he was in a situation where I, I didn't think the fit was, was that great. I mean, I've heard that Arkansas has like a ridiculous amount of NIL money. And there are going to be guys that are going to make decisions on going to Arkansas based off of NIL. I'm not saying that is the case here. 
but I think we're going to see situations where guys are going to schools where the fit may not be the best for them, but the money is. I think that's what happened with Nick Smith. Him and Anthony Black, even though I think they played the same position, I think one, I don't know if they really complimented each other. So with all that being said, Nick Smith was the guard that most scouts and most people I talked to last summer thought was the best guard prospect in college basketball. To get him at number 13 would be an absolute win for the Toronto Raptors. You have to hope that the knee is fine. I was up late last night here at the gym. It was probably like 11 o'clock and I had a chance to watch him work out and he looks fine. So I think that Nick Smith is a, a good option there for Toronto. All right. Lastly, at number 14, if I'm the New Orleans Pelicans, I think I'm going to go with Gigi Jackson. Sorry, there's a little bit of crowd noise in the background. Looks like they're playing an intense game of horse or something like that with some of the coaches for the teams of the, the prospects and the scrimmages today. If I'm New Orleans, I think I'm going to go with Gigi Jackson. I think with Gigi Jackson in New Orleans, you get a, a young, a really young player who would in my opinion, be the number one player in the 2024 draft. You get a young player you can develop that has tremendous upside as a shot maker. He could be insurance for Zion Williamson, who is never healthy. He provide insurance for Zion. He is, again, like I said, someone that you can develop. If Zion is healthy, then you could bring him along slowly. And if you're going for like the most talented player with the highest upside, I think it's Gigi Jackson. So if I'm the New Orleans Pelicans, I'm selecting Gigi Jackson. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. I am live at Wintrust Arena in Chicago, Illinois. We are just a few hours away from day, I guess it's day two, officially day two of the NBA Combine, even though we've been here three days and the scrimmages start in a few hours. Stay tuned to Locked On NBA Big Board. We are going to have updates throughout the NBA Combine throughout the week. And also, go to NBABigBoard.com. I have updated my, my latest mock draft with the lottery results. Again, it's Rafael Barlow, live from Chicago, Illinois, and I am out.